I love that. Mm-hmm. That's a really good one. Good for grounding. I'm recording already. <laughs> we entered the time portal, baby, where it just yeah. time is illusory. It doesn't exist. Welcome to Openly Spoken, the podcast to help you show up, <laughs> speak out, and be seen within your relationships, your work, and most importantly, with your relationship with yourself. In this podcast, we talk about all things self-love, relationships, sexuality, spirituality, and more. Hi, I'm your host, Celia Antonio, and I'm a women's sexuality and self-love coach, a mindfulness expert, and your cheerleader for your most grounded and expansive self-expression. You can connect with me on Instagram at selfexpressedbabe, and for all of my guest episodes, there will always be links in the show notes so that you can find them online. I give my deepest thanks to you for being here and spending your precious time with me today. Now let's begin our journey. Today's guest is Jenny Jechter, and Jenny is a relationship coach for women in midlife. She helps them transform their relationship to alcohol to create more intimacy in their partnerships, structure in their home life, and well-being in their bodies. Thank you for joining us today, Jenny. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And today we're going to talk a little bit about alcohol and alcohol use, um, and also like a little bit about relationships. And I think I think the way we first connected, you talked about... Um, I think we talked about how like common it is to use alcohol and how it's not so common to live sober curious or live like a sober life like people are like why aren't you drinking are you pregnant like it's so normalized yeah. so yeah so I'm excited about this conversation me too it's my favorite thing to talk about actually <laughs> yeah yeah I would love to know if maybe you want to start with like sharing a little bit about you and your story and how you got to this point Yeah, thank you. I'd love to. So I was in the alcohol industry for about 14 years, actually. So I was a sales rep for 11 years and then a district manager for almost three. And I developed like not a drinking problem, Mm -hmm. but a drinking habit, I would say. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, when I would look at like my drinking over the course of my life, like I had periods, of course, like in college, like, oh, I'm going to binge on this $10 gallon of shitty vodka. Can we cuss here? Yeah. yeah. Just, okay. <laughs> this shitty vodka <laughs> and then feel hungover. Um, and then, you know, probably making poor decisions with dating experiences mm. because mm-hmm. you're under the influence of alcohol and, and there is all that. Um, and then in my work environment you know it's you're you're kind of like when you're a fish in water you don't know you're in water mm. I would say. Mm-hmm. so like i would look at how much i drank which would be like three or four nights a week maybe mm-hmm. like a couple glasses of wine and because i was always having that litmus test of am i hung over the next day and the answer uh... would be no because <laughs> I have two glasses of wine you know like i would think like this is not a problem Mm. But I wasn't actually noticing how negative my brain was, how like, mm. uh, like dampened my body felt. Mm-hmm. And it didn't, it wasn't until I started to get into coaching and I was actually in a program and they had like a stop over drinking program, but I was like, over drinking, <laughs> like, what even is that? What even Uh is that? And I remember going through the certification, actually, because I had been in the program. I was like, I want to go get certified. And I was receiving some feedback from the coach on my coaching. And it was such an automatic habit that I didn't even realize this was happening. But I was having an activation, like from being criticized. Like my brain was hearing me get criticized. And I was like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to go. From the feedback. Yeah, Mm -hmm. from the feedback. You know, Mm -hmm. like I wasn't receiving the feedback in a constructive way. Yeah. And my response was to go have a glass of wine on Monday, you know, and my boundary had always been like, well, I don't have wine on Monday, you know, like mm-hmm. I don't drink Monday or Wednesday, you know, it's like, I always have those boundaries for myself. And I had this glass of wine on Monday and I was sitting there like drinking by myself, like how, and it was just like one glass that I had, 
right? Mm-hmm. But the purpose was to calm me. Mm, and so yeah. I was listening to this over drinking program part of like, it really like, it brought a bright light into my own use of alcohol. And mm-hmm. what I had always considered myself to be like, I drank way less than most people I knew. Yeah. And yet here I was using it as a tool to control how I felt. Mm. And it just became this aha moment where I was like, I don't want this. Yeah. I don't want to use alcohol to control how I feel. I want to, even if I don't know how to feel how I feel in the best way, like I at least want to not be using this as my tool. And so I took alcohol out for 105 days and I was still working in the alcohol industry at this point. Oh, wow. I remember like, and this is something I say to my, in my marketing a lot, like your brain is going to tell you all the reasons you can't take it out. But I took alcohol out for 105 days while I was in the alcohol industry. <laughs> you know, I'm sober and my husband owns a bar. <laughs> so we always get to choose, you know, we get to yeah. choose the reality that we have in this relationship with alcohol and we have to call out our lies. So yeah. that was what got me super interested in looking at my relationship with alcohol. I spent five years being in the sober curious space, like having periods of taking it out for a long time and then having like just, you know, planned drinking. Um, and it wasn't until uh, March of this year that I decided like I wanted to be completely sober. Mm-hmm. And even then I was like, I don't know if I'm completely decided. <laughs> decided. Um, I just knew I wasn't drinking, you know, like I wasn't yeah. decided that sober was even the word for me. I mm. just knew that I just wasn't going to drink. Yeah. But, like there was still like that open door in my mind. Mm-hmm. And then something happened like at the six month mark where it's like, no, this is who you are. Like, this is now part of your identity. And it's like, it's so awesome. <laughs> so, yeah my story with alcohol and there's lots of highlights and lowlights that we could probably get into it, but we know. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm celebrating you from going from having this habit that you weren't really conscious of to not drinking at all now. That's big. That's huge. And, um, yeah, you're welcome. And some of the things I heard you say that stood out to me is that, um, one of the things was like this litmus test of I'm not, I'm not hung over the next day, so it's fine. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm drinking less than the people around me. So it's fine. And what else stood out to me was what you said about choice. Um, Mm -hmm. because I think because alcohol is so common, um, people think they have to do it Yeah, to socialize. Like, you go to a holiday party, you assume that you have to drink yes. drink, and it's because it's so normalized, people look at you weird when you don't. Like I've experienced that myself. Like I've, I used to live in New York City and I remember I went to a, a birthday party and um, at this time they were starting to have kombucha on tap at bars. And I'm like, yes, I don't have to drink. Cause for me, alcohol, like I like it. I'm not sober. I do like wine sometimes. Yeah. Um, but if I drink like a, like a drink, like a hard drink, like something with vodka or something like that, my body does not feel good at all. My body yeah. does not like it. Um, but in the past, I've definitely drank it anyways because I'm out mm. socializing on that quote unquote, that's what you do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, I had kombucha at this party, and everyone's like, what are you drinking, kombucha? Yeah. But if you're at this point where you um, love yourself, and you've got you, and you're, like, securing yourself, you get that power of choice back, and you can yeah. make that decision without making it mean something about you, like something bad about you, yeah. even if other people judge you. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that that's, that's a really normal thing too, that you go through when you're making this decision. I have a couple of clients right now too, that that was their fear. Like, you know, I'm deciding to not drink because when I work with my clients, like it's like, it's 90 days minimum mm-hmm. alcohol free. Like that's part of my process. 90 days at awesome. a minimum. It takes yeah. just that long to even like get our dopamine regulated and to really yeah. feel 
how good you feel not consuming alcohol on a regular basis. And the fear is like what the other people will think I have a problem. Mm. And it's so interesting oh, too. because you're like, I'm sober. And then they're like, oh, if they're sober, that means they're an alcoholic. Do you mean that? Yes. Uh, okay. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I've never yeah. thought about that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I think like, you know, alcoholism, they don't even necessarily use that word anymore. It's like alcohol use disorder and it's on a spectrum. Okay. Okay. And I think that a majority of drinkers are on the spectrum somewhere, you know, with it mm-hmm. being green, like there's not like a huge, there's not flag, there's not, but then yellow and red, yeah. you know, and like you get to the red, it's like, they're saying like, you're someone who should never touch alcohol again, <laughs> you know? And I was never at red. I honestly don't even feel like at times in my life, I was even in the yellow, mm-hmm. but I also just think it's so much easier to just not drink it. <laughs> For me, it's so much, so much easier. Mm-hmm. And something that you were mentioning earlier about like the taste of it, like you don't like it. The further away you get from consuming alcohol, the less you think it tastes good because it will mm. actually taste like burning. Mm, that makes sense. You're like desensitized <laughs> to it if you're constantly consuming it. Yes. And like when I would go for periods of not having it and then try like a glass of wine, mm-hmm. all I tasted was burning <laughs> because that's actually no flavor, just burning. burning. <laughs> It's like, this just tastes like, I, I feel like, uh, like, uh, butters or fr- from the South Park. Do you remember? Like, it tastes uh-huh. like the kind of funny character, but I'm like, that's what it, it tastes like burning. <laughs> you know? That's so funny. <laughs> because it's like what we don't want to say is that like, and say like, like I am consuming a toxin. Like I'm actually consuming a poison. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what it feels like. And like, actually, like when your body is getting drunk, that's what your body's experiencing is it it's being poisoned. Yeah, that's true. Or actually the effects of your body responding to it, it being poisoned. Mm-hmm. But that's not sexy to put on a bar. That's not sexy to like put on a glass of like a back of a wine bottle. Yeah. You know, yeah. But that is the reality, you know, but we, we take, I got a Diet Coke here. Is there poison there? I don't know. You know, it's like, we're, we live in a toxic world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, how do you think that, I mean, I'm sure there's many ways, but I'd, I'd love to know, like, how do you think that the alcohol use, whether it's a habit or no matter where it is on the spectrum, um, how do you think that affects someone's relationship with their body and their body sensations and like knowing their body and advocating for their body? Cause that's where all, like all the things that you work with people with like intimacy and um, having a closer relationship or a closer marriage. I, I was just uh, looking around at your Instagram right before this call. And I saw one post ended with like uh, fall in love with, if you want to fall in love with your husband again, follow me. Yeah. So I feel like all of that starts with your internal world. Yeah. And I would love to know how you have found that alcohol affects that or changes that. And then how taking um, it away transforms that. Yeah. Well, I think one, we physically alcohol numbs sensation, right? Mm. So even though what it does in our meant in our mental perception of like desire. And if we're just talking like being intimate and like sexual stuff, like with your partner or with anybody, it's like, we think that we're more turned on, but physically mm. we're actually not. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So yeah. It actually makes things drier and oh. it's so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, like a ruse, you know, yeah, but yeah. it makes, it makes you think that your desire is heightened, but your body is actually not, re- is not responsive. So there's like a disconnect, mm-hmm. right? And my experience was like, I would want to do this sexy, fun stuff with my husband. I would want to be like more free in the bed and say the things that I wanted to say, <clears throat> ask for the things that I wanted. And when I drank and this was not necessarily like, cause we've been together 14 years. So it's not necessarily like in the past 
like five or six years or whatever. Mm -hmm. But definitely in the beginning, I thought I needed alcohol to unleash myself. Mm. You know, That's relatable. Like I was, yeah. Yeah. I was using alcohol to not feel shame around my own sexual desires and experience in my body. I would use it to even like force myself to be someone I wasn't in bed. Yeah. That's you know, so like, relatable. I, yeah. I think he's going to like this. And this is definitely more in the beginning of our relationship. Like, I think he's going to like this more. So I'm going to pretend I'm this person in bed. Yeah. Because I'm uninhibited. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that you don't actually get to create the cellular memories of these experiences. Mm. Because damp and it's like it's like you've taken a wet cloth and put it over every cell that is like trying to experience itself inside of you and create an experience for you and you're saying no mm -hmm. i'm gonna put this outer layer of re like this fakeness mm -hmm. you know and then it then your body doesn't get to memorize it. Your body doesn't create to get to create like the memory or the safety or the trust. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying all this, and I'm also <laughs> I'm also not saying, and it's bad that you're doing this. I'm saying it's not helpful, most likely for what you want long term. Yeah. And it's understandable because of conditioning that we have. And insecurities that we have it's like i can accept like this if yes this is my reality this is how i've been conditioned and i don't want to continue to use something to make myself be someone i'm not yeah let me just go through the nice the more natural organic and maybe slower experience of getting to know somebody and getting to know myself mm -hmm. instead of hijacking it all the time with alcohol mm-hmm mm -hmm. It's like an intimacy hijacker, you know, it's like yeah. trying to fast, putting fast forward on real intimacy. And that's why it's like, doesn't ever feel like you're really connecting. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah that makes a lot of sense because it gets in the way of truth. And, yeah. um, yeah. And what you said is so relatable because in our society, like sexuality is definitely something that is shamed, especially for women. Mm -hmm. Um, like, men are allowed to go fuck bitches or like whatever they say <laughs> but like women are not given that same freedom to just be themselves yeah. as sexual beings and yeah. so yeah that's so relatable that um alcohol would be this way to be unleashed i think so many yeah. people can relate to that i can relate to that myself and, and even like saying like oh i'm gonna I'm going to go ahead and prescribe myself this porn version of who I think my partner wants mm -hmm. me to be as mm -hmm. opposed to be like being this more like flower goddess that I actually feel like I am, <laughs> you yeah. know, like I look, look back, I'm like, Oh, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then not just with sexuality, like there are also other emotions um, that women are usually not given space for, like being angry, for example. Yes. So I would love to know, like, since you work with women in, in midlife, I would love to know, like, what do you think is unique about the experience for women? And then also like for women specifically in midlife, because there's also extra like life trans transitions you're going through. Um, maybe, maybe someone in midlife is dealing with sending their kids off to college. Maybe someone in midlife is starting to experience like perimenopause or menopause or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's like so many things that start to shift and change. So yeah. I'd love to know about that. I just want to get clear on your question. Are you saying, what do I think the experience is for taking alcohol out or changing the relationship with alcohol for women in midlife? Yeah. Ch changing it specifically yeah. for women in midlife like what is unique about the experience for women in midlife with alcohol and i definitely can't speak for like all experiences but i can say um because we all have kid we we might have kids we might not have kids we're going through menopause at different stages 
-hmm. but I would say like in generalities, um, you're at that point to assume that like my, you know, I'm speaking to someone who has a lot of the same things as me. Like you're dealing Mm -hmm. with two working parent households. You're dealing with, um, you know, more involvement in different types of schooling activities. So there's that there tends to be like this Tetris that you're constantly doing within your house to keep up with, you know, what is the demands of having kids, having a job, having a partner, like keeping the house clean. So there's, there's a certain level of demand. And then Mm -hmm. there's this, like, I I feel like there's the opportunity for like a boredom to come Mm in, in your partnership. I feel like if you have not, if you haven't created the space for you and your partner to grow differently together, there is the opportunity to grow apart. Mm. And there, there's usually the, I would say like the opportunity for, um, the stress of the kids and raising kids to create this tension in the relationship that if it goes unrepaired and unnoticed for so long, you then have this like deep, deeper separation Mm. and also this, well, I can't divorce because I don't want to mess up the family, you know, Mm. or like, I don't want to, I'll divorce when the kids are gone. So then there's like this could be this like dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. There's your body changing because Mm -hmm. your hormones are changing. And what alcohol does is it can actually tell you everything's okay when it's not okay. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's like, do you actually need to change your job? Mm. Do you actually need to change your lifestyle? Are you living a lifestyle that is unsustainable for the well-being of you and your partner and your marriage and your family? Mm-hmm. And I think that alcohol, like, no matter if it's midlife or you're young or you're older, the opportunity is to lie. Mm. To wow, lie. yeah. <laughs> you know. To lie to yourself? <laughs> to lie to yourself because you yeah. can say how I am feeling isn't, you can just brush it off yeah. or you can use it. It's like, I'm just going to get through, mm-hmm. you know? So I think every stage of life, there is the opportunity to not be in this truthful honesty of like what's happening for you emotionally, mm-hmm. physically, circumstantially. And, and alcohol is, feels like a very easy, easy tool. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like, and I, and I do say like, I don't think a lot of people have tools, you know, like, yeah, that's they probably really why them. they're reaching for alcohol. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I want to say too, it's like, it's not like, like, Oh, everyone's so sad. and They're only drinking because they're sad. I think there can just be like, like people are drinking because they're happy too. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think like in midlife it, at this point, it, it's probably become such an automatic habit yeah. that you might not, like you might be missing these polarity experiences on either side like like this like go into like the deepest pains of your heart yeah while also opening up space for like this ecstatic joy that yeah. like it's like like because you're there it is a time where you get to like know yourself differently there's just mm. things that happen in your 40s where you're like oh my god i don't give a fuck about that anymore oh my god why do i care about that and i think when you keep alcohol as a habit it keeps you in this very narrow lane Mm. As opposed to like, now let's really expand to, I'm willing to feel the depths of pain and like the heights of like joy. Mm. Yeah. You know? And I think like, I want to be available for that, mm-hmm. for all of it. And so in midlife, I think like, this is the perfect time, mm-hmm. you know, it's the perfect time to change this and to say like, okay, now I want to... 100% focus on my health and get into the sexiest shape I've ever been in. Like, I want to be the impossible <laughs> for people. Like, I just think in my 40s, I just keep getting hotter. You know, like, how wonderful for that. For like, for all women to be able to experience that. My yeah. relationship just keeps getting hotter. Yeah. You know, like, we, like, and I, I want that for women in midlife. Mm-hmm. Because when the kids go, assuming like they have kids, mm-hmm. I want so set up for like 
more expansion. Yeah. Not like, oh, yeah, now yeah. What? Yeah, I love that because um, I'm sure that's like a huge identity crisis of like, if I don't have my kids to take care of, now <laughs> what do I do? And um, since you just since you just said that um, in my forties I keep getting hotter, I just want to voice that you are gorgeous. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so her methods work. Also, <laughs> Botox, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sobriety and weight training yeah <laughs> and also like when when you start hitting that age as well um another thing in media that's so normalized besides alcohol is that like youngness equals beautiful mm. and um so i can only imagine being midlife as a woman uh because i don't i don't think at least in you know hollywood when a when a man is older he's like celebrated and seen as like hot and stuff like for example um pedro pascal mm -hmm. he's gorgeous um yeah. but a woman at that at the same age with you know gray hair not coloring their hair is not celebrated in hollywood so yeah. there's kind of this uh, probably narrative of like my life is over now like it, it's done yeah yeah and i, and I think that there's this and I say this a lot in my marketing, like feeling sexy, mm -hmm. you know, like that I really like, I I've looked at different women of different sizes and ages and men the same way, like, and like, God, like this individual is so sexy and it's, it's an energy mm, that they, yes. care, you know, yeah. like it's such an energy and it's, and it really yeah. is, it's like an embodiment. Yeah, it totally you know? is. Mm -hmm. And so I think at any age and, you know, size and whatever is going on, like there's an embodiment that happens when a woman is feeling certain, mm. you know, yeah. feeling sexy. And it is my belief that alcohol doesn't allow us to tap into the depths of that. Yes. Yeah. Alcohol is a habit, not alcohol as a celebration, not alcohol as like, here's an exclamation point to yeah. the sentence, you know, like, but you know, like if you have a, a sentence with all exclamation points, it reads crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like how can we incorporate, like, or if you choose to keep it in, keep it in as an exclamation point, make it make sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I love that explana ex exclamation point <laughs> analogy. Yes. And yeah. I love what you said earlier that you kind of just touched on now of like when you don't have alcohol as this kind of like barrier of what's true and the truth of your feelings, then you're able to go, you're, you're, you're able to experience this more wider spectrum of like the deepest pain and also the most expansive like bliss and love. Yes. Um, and I think those are kind of like, because it's like a polarity thing here, I feel like you have to be willing to face that pain in order to like, in the journey of feeling that pain, that bliss and love that's deeper than you ever experienced before is what's the light at the end of, at the end of the tunnel. Yes. And I, I, even in my own processes and like taking myself into like deeper experiences of like heartbreak and, um, mm -hmm. like past things from my past, like that, that bliss and love comes right after the pain. Yeah. It's like, it really does. Process, it's like, <laughs> It's like right there. Yeah. You know? And that has been profound to experience. Mm -hmm. It's been profound to experience that like that experience is available whenever I want it. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to create it every day. I'm not trying to create that heightened experience because I don't need it. Cause that, that means like, I'm like, I hate how I feel, you know, it's mm. like, I don't need that. Like, I feel like with alcohol, when we get into the habit, a lot of times we're just unconsciously trying to keep, like maintain this level mm -hmm. that just isn't sustainable. Mm, yeah. We're not, we're like, we're not allowing things to ebb and flow. Yeah. 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 It's very much like kind of resisting nature because in nature, you know, there's winter and there's fall, yeah. spring, summer. 
And um, even what you said about just now about like right after the pain is where the bliss is. It's almost like right after the coldest winter and it's just so freezing. Yeah. That's when new flowers pop up right after that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think that I think there's a grand design in that in that architecture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So if anyone is listening to this and they're like, oh, I use alcohol as a habit and they mm -hmm. are wanting to take like the first step to be able to feel that wide spectrum of emotion while also being um, resourced, what would you what would you suggest? Yeah. So one way that I've worked with clients in the past, like if they don't want to take it out completely, especially not at first, mm -hmm. is to create a drink plan mm. for yourself. Interesting. And yeah. What you would do is you would think about ahead of the week, like, what am I doing this week and how much do I want to drink and with who and why do I want to drink? And you would write it all out. So you're being very intentional. And this does a couple of things. So like one, it helps to build self-integrity and self-trust. Mm -hmm. because I tell them like, put down exactly how much you're going to drink. If you're going to drink a bottle of wine, I want you to put that you're going to drink a bottle because your brain will still want you to drink a bottle and a half, you know, mm. so yeah. drink exactly what you say you're going to drink and following through with that. And then just even bringing awareness to like how you're feeling before and after is so powerful. Yeah. And in this process, especially because essentially what we're doing is we're decreasing every single week. Um, and this varies depending on how much someone is drinking right now. But then those nights that you're not drinking, you're with yourself. Mm -hmm. Or that weekend that you say, I'm going to have my first alcohol-free weekend. You might actually not feel things, mm. you know, because a lot of times the habit is to actually just resist so what most people might feel is like a tension, mm. you know? And so like, so that first occurrence of like, oh, I feel tense in my body because there is a wanting and not having experience. Mm. Like I'm wanting to have a drink and I'm not having it. And this is true for people who don't consider themselves alcoholics because we have mental cravings mm -hmm. and that mental craving creates desire and then not having desire. Mm. So like the first, that someone could expect and a way to move through that is just oh I'm just ex gonna expect I won't feel good I'm just going mm -hmm. to expect tension and maybe like a little bit of anxiety and that's totally fine mm -hmm. so just this one I would say expectation that it won't feel good in your body no matter how much you've been drinking in the past like it most likely won't feel good in your body because you're changing a habit so that expectation and then as much as possible, just a dropping in to like the acceptance of that. Mm, the acceptance of it feeling uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. You know? And then I would, I would, in, I would invite anyone to like maybe even Google like meditative practices or, you know, ways to drop into your body. I know like with you and I, with our coaching practices, like we, know mm -hmm. how to do that so if you work with a coach or you work with a somatic coach or a therapist or even like everything's available online mm -hmm. you know like you really truly can like find all the resources for free you can even probably watch someone teaching something for free on google and learn how to like drop into those sensations in your body but the the process is really learning how to be with the different intensity sensations of wanting and not having Mm. which I think is the first layer of like deconditioning, like how much you want alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then the second layer is like, what were these emotions that you didn't want to feel in the first place? Yeah. And that, and so that's like, like, like what'd you say? I didn't hear you. Then they're like kind of like coming up like, we, okay, now, now it's our turn. Hey, <laughs> hey girl, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> and that's the thing that I think will probably scare a lot of people like oh i don't want to do that so yeah. how how would you communicate that that is worth it the experience of changing your relationship with alcohol 
the experience of changing your relationship with alcohol and all those emotions that you were trying to avoid coming up, bubbling up to the surface. Yeah, because we only, we do things in life and we don't do things in life because of how we want to feel and how we don't want to feel. Mm-hmm. So when you're never scared of how you'll feel, imagine what things you will do or be open to experiencing in your life. Mm. You know, imagine like if you're not scared to feel what changes in the decisions that you make for the life that you want. Yeah. I love that. You know, that sounds so very liberating. Yeah. I think, I think it is. And it's, it's not like it's okay. Here's this work and now I'm done. You know, like I continue to find new spaces in myself of like, Oh, this emotion I don't like <laughs> this. <emotion> I don't like, <laughs> you know, but it, it, it also too, like, I don't want to say like, Oh, you're going to have all these crazy emotions. You're going to have to feel some of them can be so subtle, like just like insecurity mm-hmm. at a party mm-hmm. or like not as confident mm-hmm. at a party just feeling bored on Friday. Mm-hmm. Like some of these aren't like these big, huge, dramatic emotions. Some of these are just like really simple human experiences mm-hmm. that you just then get to be a part of. Mm-hmm. I'd love to also know then for, I think it would be helpful for people to know as those emotions have come up for you and as you've embraced, you know, all these uncomfortable emotions, what are maybe a few cool things that have resulted out of you feeling those emotions and like embracing it and making peace with them? Yeah. Well, you know, the first time I took alcohol out for 105 days, I got so much clarity about what I wanted in my life. And so mm-hmm. I left my career of 14 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> to, like, full time. I'm not saying that it was the most graceful way to do it. Like we did it in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, so, and then we moved, you know, so, but, um, you know, it has opened me up to taking risks mm. and my own resiliency trusting your own resiliency I love that like I'm not scared of shit you know what I mean like I feel like I have my own back like um my mom passed away earlier this year and that was actually when I decided Mm -hmm. like I want to take alcohol completely because I didn't want to Mm -hmm. miss like the, the teachings of grief yeah you know like how beautiful grief is has been informing me and I think grief is one of those emotions that people are very scared of, of feeling like people yeah. were very scared of loss. That's why we try to control things so much. We're so scared of loss. But when you say like, that doesn't scare me because I don't see anything as just being bad. I can always see this like, and it's not being Pollyanna. It's literally actually being whole. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm not only focusing on this. Like I, I feel like the pain of losing someone that I love very much, but then there's also like all this amazing things that like these gifts that are coming. And I think that changing my relationship with alcohol has opened me up to the gifts of life that I think I would have just missed. Mm, Yeah. I'm paying attention. Yeah. You know, I'm paying attention to these moments that feel insignificant, but are actually like gifts. You know? Mm -hmm. So quit my job, managing this experience of grief. Like, you know, we're renovating a house from the twenties. It feels like it's Ooh, fun. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, like, so it's, I, I think that it, the opportunity is for a wider range experience of life that actually creates more fulfillment. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. So I have these questions that I like to ask towards the end to every guest. Before I bring those in, I would love to know if there's anything that you wish I would have asked you Mm. about any of the topics that we brought up. Anything that you kind of maybe came here really wanting to share? No, I don't think you're, I don't, I didn't have an agenda. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you're welcome. So the first question is, what does self-love mean to you? 
Mm. Self-love means that I catch myself myself in the moments that I'm in extreme judgment Mm -hmm. of myself or other people Mm -hmm. and offer myself compassion for just being here. Self-love is reminding myself that I am a human. Nice. That, brain, that's an Sydney. answer I haven't heard on this podcast yet. <laughs> my, my brain likes to like, you know, be lots of imperfection, imperfectionism and stuff. And so for me, self-love is like, you're human. Oh, you're human. Yeah. Yeah. That's very relatable. I love that. So, and then what makes you feel the most grounded? Like an activity? An activity, a person. Oh, uh, oh. I know what it is. Okay. What is it? When I'm not trying to control other people. <laughs> what are you doing when you're not trying to control other people? I am in myself. I'm in trust of the universe and like God's influence in someone else's life. Uh-huh. I am believing I have to rescue anyone Mm, yeah Um, I am in compassion for them having a human experience even if my brain thinks I know better yeah you know so it's like when I'm grounded I am staying in my own lane Mm -hmm. you know Um, and not trying to control everything yeah for everyone and by control I also mean like rescue and think I know you know Mm -hmm. so like my my favorite sentence is like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds very grounding. Just like yeah. surrendering, like letting it go. Yeah. And I, I think there's actually this thing that I realized recently where it's this difference from being like unattached, mm-hmm. you know, being like hyper controlling. There's like this healthy middle, mm. you know, that I still are like navigating, you know, mm-hmm. it's really good. Very nice. It's newer for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next question is, what's your favorite part about being human? Oh, hmm. My favorite part about being human. <laughs> the answer is like the cookies. <laughs> the cookies. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Cookies are great. I love that cookies like, exist, <laughs> especially yeah, homemade like, ones. <laughs> gosh like just getting to taste cookie like just getting to taste like I think that's Mm. like one of my senses is like you know just getting to enjoy you know like yeah get to enjoy this look at me I get to enjoy this cookie I get to enjoy Mm -hmm. this thing like um so maybe like the opportunity to enjoy Mm -hmm. so are you a big foodie no so no. like I, I, I'm not honestly like I I'm like a oh my god what's the best burger I need the best burger like I want the best ice cream sandwich, um, I spent all that time in the alcohol industry and I got to call on some of the most amazing restaurants in Atlanta, uh-huh. and I really got my experience in all those restaurants. You know it's mm-hmm. like I love, I love going out to dinner, but I kind of also don't care anymore. Mm. Like, yeah, I'm happy like the vibes of places mm-hmm. like I love going like it, the aesthetic is like it's like anthropology threw up everywhere you know like that, <laughs> that's what I like but I also like I'll take the burger here yeah yeah <laughs> you know? yeah that's that's me <laughs> yeah cooking at home is it is in my opinion a lot better it is Especially always, like, um, I don't know how behind the scenes you were at a restaurant, but I've seen some things that happen in the yes. kitchen. Yes. I worked in like... restaurants, yep. <laughs> All through college and grad school, I worked in restaurants. So I know that there is a, can be some gross stuff. But even with that, I'm like, there's going to be some gross stuff at my house too. You know, like cats walk <laughs> over, kids doing stuff. But I do agree, like, especially with, um, you know, the cost of food these days, I'm like, yeah. I can make yeah. this at home and it's just as good, if not better. And I know 
all the ingredients are quality ingredients. Yeah, especially when it's like Italian food because like spaghetti and meatballs is like so cheap to make at home, but go to a restaurant, it's like $30 a plate. <laughs> are you Italian? No, I'm not Italian. My oh, name, okay. my first name is Italian, but I'm not it Italian. Is, yeah. I'm okay. German and Greek. <laughs> okay. well, I'm German too. Oh, nice. Yeah. Awesome. Um, one more question and then I'll ask about where people can find you. And then once we stop hitting record, I want to hear about you being German. <laughs> so what is your favorite part about being a woman? Oh, hmm. I mean, I know only when it's not just women that get to do this, but I just love like the getting dressed up and makeup and hair and all of it, like really mm -hmm. getting to be in my razzle dazzle, like <laughs> love that so much. Like you talked about my nails earlier. It's like, this is this feminine aspect of me that I love, like the lipstick, the hair, the outfit, the shoes. I love it all. Yeah. <laughs> and I know it's not just for women, but like, that's what's coming alive for me right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. That's like a fun a way to play with art and like make your body the art and make your like yeah. embodiment the art. Yeah. Yeah. Super oh, fun. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of grew up very interested in fashion because I play with yeah. Barbies and like my mom is a total glamour lady and I studied fashion design. Um, but I had kind of like an unhealthy relationship with that. Mm. And it wasn't until maybe four years ago where I started seeing um, the way you dress and the way you do your hair and stuff as an embodiment practice. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it like changed my perspective a bit about it. <laughs> yes, oh, I love that. I love how you said that, it's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. So for everyone listening, where can they find you, find out more about you and work with you? Yeah, the best way to get in contact me, with me or to get to know me more is through Instagram. Um, and I am at the Jenny Jector. And I'll, I guess you'll put in show notes like how to spell that. Yeah, or I'll, put, should I spell I'll it? put in the show notes. Yeah. yeah how to spell it. Um, I don't always have everything on Facebook, but Instagram is really it. Like I don't have a website and you can book um, a consultation call with me if you want to learn more about how I work with my clients um, and part mm -hmm. of my process. And that's, yeah, that's the best way. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. This is great.